Sister Vasa, and today I'm delighted to be sharing with you my paper for this year's Orientale Lumen Conference. For this year's Orientale Lumen 24 conference, which is focusing on the topic of liturgy and icons, worshiping with images, I'd like to share some thoughts on one of the icons of the Byzantine Divine Liturgy, one that is receiving a lot of press in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, namely the communion spoon. In what follows, I will first explore what is meant by icon in Byzantine theology, why it is that the sacramental life of the church operates through sacred images or symbols, and why it's important for the faithful who participate in Byzantine liturgy to know its symbolic language. Further, I will discuss the communion spoon specifically, how and why it came to be seen as one of the sacred symbols within the symbol gestalt or symbolic structure of the Byzantine divine liturgy and why its symbolic place in that structure is important. The discussions and publications that I have read online concerning the communion spoon, including those who profess a concern for tradition, seem either to ignore the symbolic aspect of the spoon or at least to be misinformed about it. This I find is unhelpful to the subject at hand because symbolism is so integral to every part of Byzantine liturgy. Finally, I will draw some practical conclusions for the topical issue facing the church today of what is to be done or not to be done with the communion spoon in the COVID-19 era. So let's get to the first part of my paper. What is an icon? The term icon or ikon in Greek, meaning in general terms, likeness, image, or picture, refers in scriptural and patristic writings to a vast array of things, events, concepts, and persons, beginning with Christ himself. Christ himself is the image or icon of the invisible God, as St. Paul says to the Colossians, ikon tu theu auratu. It is through the visible incarnate Lord that the eyes of faith are given to see the invisible God. In Christ, as St. John Chrysostom put it, one saw one thing but understood another. One saw a man and believed it was God. It is on the basis of the incarnation of Christ uniting or indeed reuniting in himself the human and the divine the visible and invisible, the physical and the spiritual, the earthly and the heavenly, that the visible sacramental celebrations of the church within physical time and space indeed represent, represent to us the heavenly timeless reality or make present to us the invisible God and his truth and draw us into being present to him again and again. Hence it is through the visible icons or symbols of different kinds in our liturgical life, both within and beyond the walls of church buildings, that the hidden mysteries of God are revealed to us and that we enter into union or communion with him by the continuous outpouring onto the church of the grace of the Holy Spirit. A visible symbol coming from the Greek verb symvalo, meaning to bring together, serves to bring us together with the invisible reality. And our sacramental life as church cannot work any other way than through symbols, as St. Dionysius the Areopagite points out, because the human being, as one limited to time and space in this world, needs material likenesses or images to lead him or her to contemplation. So it is true of liturgy, Christian liturgy, both in East and West, that it works through symbols. As Joseph, then Cardinal Ratzinger, wrote in his wonderful little book, The Spirit 
of the liturgy, quote, we need the intermediary and do not yet see the Lord as he is. That is why the theology of the liturgy is, in a special way, symbolic theology, end of quote. Now I get to the third part of my paper, understanding icons through mystery and history. But it's important to note that the symbolic theology of the Byzantine liturgy, as distinct from the Roman rite of today, is not easily comprehensible to the uneducated faithful, nor does it aim to be. The reformed post-Vatican II Roman liturgy aims to be easily comprehensible as outlined by the liturgy constitution of the council Sacro Sanctum Concilium. Quote from the liturgy constitution, the rites should be marked by a noble simplicity. They should be short, clear, and unencumbered by useless repetitions. They should be within the people's power of comprehension and as a rule, not require much explanation." End of quote. The Byzantine rite, on the other hand, presumes its faithful to have been catechized in what is called mystagogy, that is in Greek, mystagogia, meaning an initiation into the mysteries. It is the mystagogical interpretation of the liturgical rites that we are talking about. It was through being instructed in the symbolic or allegorical, you see, not only mystagogical, which means those leading into the mystery, mystery meaning that which is hidden, doesn't mean it's not supposed to be discovered, but it's hidden to the immediate, you know, uneducated eye. But it's these allegorical explanations that help achieve that leading into the mystery. Allegory means, well, it comes from two Greek uh, words, alos, meaning otherwise, and agorevin, which means to explain or interpret. So to interpret or explain otherwise, that is otherwise than what you see at face value, that is what allegory is about. Okay, so if I see three windows, say, three windows uh, in my uh, room, right? And I say to myself, I'm actually seeing, or I'm being reminded of in any event, I'm being reminded of the Holy Trinity, because it's helping me. It's, it's just uh, a reason for me. It's an occasion for me to think about God. So I hope we understand what allegory means. And for those of you, maybe all of you who already knew what it means, I do apologize for insulting your intelligence, but let's move on. So it was through being instructed um, by these allegorical uh, and symbolic meanings of, of the liturgical space and actions and celebrants, vestments, vessels, text, and so on, that one traditionally learned the symbolic, symbolic, I'll remind you from symbolo, that's bringing together the invisible reality through a visible and familiar symbol, right? So our earthly reality is being connected, brought together with an invisible reality through the familiar symbol. Okay, so it's through these symbolic explanations bringing all that together, that one was instructed in the symbolic language of Byzantine liturgy and was thus led into, initiate, initiated into the mystery. This is the way one was mystagogized. Aside from mystagogical instruction, understanding the Byzantine liturgy today also requires a knowledge of its historical development as has been pointed out most recently by uh, the Russian liturgist, Father Michael Zoltov. Because of the many changes and influences that shaped the Byzantine liturgy since the era of the classic mystagogical commentators from various epochs and regions of the Byzantine empire and beyond its borders, it is often necessary to go back to the liturgical sources in the manuscript tradition in order to establish the original meaning and purpose of a liturgical unit. This historical research is also vital 
because of the very language of mystery that characterized the approach of the fathers to sacramentology. They often limited their explanations of the sacraments to allegory, avoiding dogmatic formulations of their meaning. Take even the word that we use for sacrament, that is mystery, mysterium, tainstva. So there is this approach to the sacraments that one should not say much about them. So when questions arise about the dogmatic sense of our rites and sacraments, and patristic commentaries lack sufficient answers, historical liturgiology can provide, and does provide sometimes, an important service for the church by studying the sources of the rites themselves to deepen our understanding of their dogmatic sense. But as it does often happen in our present day church, in light of the practical absence of mystagogical catechization of the faithful and the dearth of education in historical liturgiology among the people and the clergy alike, there, there is a disconnect between us and the liturgy because we by and large do not speak its language. Instead, each of us tends to have our own language, our own various understandings of the visible symbols of the celebration. And thus today, we find ourselves divided about that which we thought united us all above all, the Eucharist. And we're getting scattered as did those whose language was confused at the Tower of Babel. But let us get more specifically to the communion spoon, as that's the hot topic we've all been waiting for. Let me first briefly review its history, summarizing the exhaustive research done by my mentor, Father Robert Taft of Blessed Memory, on the topic of the liturgical spoon, and then we will address its symbolism. Do forgive me if you listened already to my audio podcast that went through all of this history, or follow the link here and you could hear that podcast if you haven't heard it yet. But I'm going to repeat briefly what I said there. Please hang in there with me if you already know this. Originally, both in East and West, lay people received the sacred species, the blood and body of Christ, separately. First, they received the consecrated holy bread in the right hand, having approached the minister of the bread, a priest or a bishop. And then the communicant would kiss the holy bread and consume it. Then he or she would approach the minister of the chalice, who originally would have been a deacon. And the communicant would drink from the chalice. It was only in exceptional cases uh, that when communicating infants or the sick and so forth, uh, that communion via intinction was practiced. And this means dipping the holy bread into the blood of Christ. But the customary practice of lay communion in Byzantium throughout almost the entire first millennium in most cases was into the hand and under separate species. Although by the ninth century, there are signs of the ancient tradition beginning to be changed in some areas. I will return to that point shortly. Note the additional detail that in the late seventh century Byzantium, the communicant when receiving the body of Christ would place the right hand on the left, palms up and folded crosswise like this when we ask for the blessing of a priest. And thus, would the faithful receive the holy bread in the right hand, as described in Canon 101 of the Council of Trullo of AD 690-691. We know that in the 11th century, it was common, if we're, let, let's move up to the 11th century now, we have separate wit uh, witnesses from the 11th century that tell us that it was already common not universal, but common in Byzantium for the faithful to be given communion via the liturgical spoon. It had appeared here and there uh, it, 
in earlier history, but it's not clear exactly what it's used for. At least it's not clear that it's used specifically for the communion of the laity. But as we can see from the mid 12th century uh, commentary on the aforementioned uh, 101st canon of the Council of Trullo, uh, the commentary of Alexios Aristinos, who was economos and nomophilox of the great church in Constantinople, lay communion under separate species was no longer the custom uh, in Constantinople uh, at his time, that is in this 12th century, no longer the cu custom in Constantinople, but it was still the custom in some other places. You see, well, just one second. Let's stay with Aristinos for one second. Aristinos indicates uh, that Holy Communion was given to the faithful directly into the mouth. And he reinterprets, even though he doesn't explicitly mention a spoon, but he mentions uh, Holy Communion being given into the mouth. He reinterprets what uh, Canon 101 has to say about the crossing of the hands, and he interprets it to mean the folding of one's arms upon the chest, as in many of, of our churches we do today when approaching Holy Communion. That's the way Aristinos understands the business of folding the hands crosswise. Nonetheless, the comments on this very canon of other 12th century commentators, and there's other, uh, another two most famous ones, we already mentioned Aristinos, but Zonaras and Balsamon, who are both uh, 12th century commentators, they reveal that still in the 12th century, communion in some areas was still given to the faithful, into the hand, and separately uh, in two separate species. I can't go into all of the details uh, of the development as researched by Father Taft, but what I'm trying to uh, describe to you and relate to you is how the dust did not settle uh, approximately throughout, you know, beginning somewhere in the ninth century and on to really into the 13th century, that this process of gradually changing to the liturgical spoon for the faithful uh, occurs. Is there an edict that explains why this happens? No, not uh, officially, okay? And as Taft would often say, watching liturgical reform happen in the East is like watching the grass grow, but it does happen. Let me move on. Let's ask why the innovation of the communion spoon was introduced, because you may be wondering, um, when clearly the Lord gave the command uh, to his disciples to do this in remembrance of him. And what is it that he did? He did give the bread and wine to his disciples separately. There's no, like I said, official decree or you know, church council uh, announcing the change of this ancient tradition. Um, but what we can glean from various witnesses and statements and the conclusion to which Father Taft came uh, was that the reason uh, for this change was a pastoral con uh, concern about possible abuses and irreverence on the part of the laity towards the holy gifts. Some of the laity would, for example, take the body of Christ, but not consume it uh, at all, or take it, you know, out of the church, even though that was allowed, there was a time when the faithful were also given to take the holy gifts home, well, the holy body of Christ. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that in this talk. I did get into it in the audio podcast. So listen to that if you're interested. In any event, the concern was that there were some wicked purposes uh, that, you know, some of the laity uh, would, you know, use the holy gifts to, like, witchcraft. The 14th century Byzantine commentator, St. Simeon of Thessaloniki, says that, quote, the fathers thought that communion should be given to the laity by a spoon because of some incidents. The Atinae Pigagonota. Next, my friends, let's look at the symbolism of the communion spoon. How is it an icon or symbol? What does it symbolize? And is that important 
for our church life today. It is in the 12th to 14th centuries when the liturgical spoon had become customary in the Byzantine liturgical realm that the liturgical spoon was first mentioned in mystagogical commentaries. In the 12th century, Commentarius Liturgicus V of Pseudo Sophronios of Jerusalem and the no earlier than 14th century De Sacra Liturgia attributed to Patriarch John the Fourth the Faster. It's only attributed to him. It's much later, actually. The communion spoon is said to symbolize the tongs with which the seraph placed the burning coal into the mouth of Isaiah. Please note that the theme of Isaiah's heavenly coal had already appeared much earlier in Byzantine liturgical commentaries, but not in reference to any spoon. So the new aspect of these commentaries of the 12th and 14th centuries is that the tongues of the seraph in Isaiah's vision are being now referred for the first time to the liturgical spoon. But here is the vision uh, described at the beginning of chapter six in the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face and with two, he covered his feet and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin forgiven. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. End of quote. According to this symbolism, my friends, I'd like to point out that the priest or bishop who's giving communion to the faithful via the spoon is being seen in the role of the seraph sent to Isaiah with a live coal from the altar of the Lord. He feeds the prophet the coal that cleanses him, and in effect, he, he empowers the prophet to respond to God's call to his vocation. This is different from the symbolism that centuries before this, St. John Chrysostom assigned to the priest's hand when distributing the body of Christ into the hands of the faithful without the spoon. Chrysostom, who lived centuries before the introduction of communion spoons into the liturgy that bears his name, saw the priest not in the role of a seraph, but in the role of the Lord himself at the mystical supper. Chrysostom urges his hearers in one of his homilies as follows, quote, believe that even now, this is the meal of which he himself partook. Therefore, when you see the priest giving you communion, do not think that it is the priest who is doing it. Think instead that it is Christ's hand that is being extended to you. End of quote. Note that Chrysostom's symbolism of lay people's communion, as compared with the heavenly coal symbolism attached to the liturgical spoon almost a millennium after his repose, also assigns a different symbolic role to lay people. The golden-mouthed father sees the lay communicants as the group of Christ's closest disciples gathered at his table, while the later symbolism of the communion spoon perceives each of us as the prophet Isaiah, who in a personal 
encounter with God in a heavenly vision to which he alone was privy, was empowered to follow his prophetic vocation. Thus the symbolism of the spoon per se is a bit more about stressing each person's uh, receiving the heavenly coal uh, for his or her own vocation. Now, I'm not pointing this out as if it's some kind of a bad thing. In fact, I love the heavenly coal symbolism in the Eucharist. But it is, what I am saying is that it is a slight shift in the direction of individualizing communion or receiving in any event as the solitary prophet Isaiah did the coal. It's a shift from experiencing it as more of a group thing as at the common table of Christ and his disciples. And that's uh, the way the celebrating clergy still do that in the altar and with that symbolism. So the liturgical spoon and its symbolism do create a bit more of a distance between clergy and laity in that they receive Holy Communion differently. I point this out because of a recent online article entitled More Dangerous Than COVID-19, in which the symbolic meaning of the communion spoon is uh, related to us quite differently, and I would say quite randomly, as far as I can see. The author of this article, not a liturgist, first describes the use of the liturgical spoon as quote unquote, deeply dogmatic, and then proceeds to tell us what the deeply dogmatic meaning of the spoon is. Now I quote that online article, quote, there is a theological reason for one spoon. It unifies us in the same way that the common cup does and the common loaf. End of quote. Aside from the odd fact that the author makes no mention of the traditional heavenly coal symbolism, of which she is evidently unaware, she is simply wrong that the theological reason for the communion spoon is to, quote unquote, as she says, to unify us. No source that I know of from our tradition speaks about the introduction of the spoon with that specific purpose in mind, either in practical pastoral terms or in symbolic uh, terms. The practical and pastoral reason for the adoption of the spoon was to keep the laity from abusing the holy gifts because the laity could not be trusted with the gifts. The symbolic significance that was then attached to the newly introduced uh, communion spoon uh, and does remain to this day, the symbolic significance is that of the tongues with which Isaiah received the heavenly coal from the seraph, as can be seen not only from the historical sources uh, that I've already mentioned, but from today's prayer of the blessing of a new spoon for the holy mysteries. This prayer mentions only this heavenly coal symbolism. And the practical result of the adoption of the use of the spoon and its symbolism is a bit of an increase in the distance between clergy and laity in their now distinct ways of receiving Holy Communion, with the clergy receiving as did the apostles at the Lord's table and the laity uh, receiving a bit otherwise. It's not my point to criticize this state of affairs. I'm just saying that there is this uh, increased difference in the liturgical experience of clergy and laity in that respect. So the author's explanation of the communion spoon's purpose as being to unify us is her own and has no basis in the fronima uh, behind, the fronima of the church behind the change to the communion spoon. One does wonder where she found her uh, explanation. We just don't know uh, because 
her article has no footnotes. But let's get to the sixth part of my paper. It is entitled, What's the Point of the Symbolism of the Spoon? Indeed, I think this is a more pertinent question and perhaps on everyone's mind. What is the point of understanding our reception of Holy Communion symbolically or allegorically, whether we remember our Lord Jesus Christ giving it to his disciples at the mystical supper, or whether we remember Isaiah's vision of the seraph giving him the burning coal. The response to the first, first question is probably obvious that it's the whole purpose of the liturgy to remember the Lord doing that. But what could be the purpose of remembering also something else? Because there are a lot of other allegorical meanings to the Byzantine divine liturgy. So what's the point of those? To answer the question, my friends, let's note first that there are different kinds of symbols or icons as understood in the church's theology and sacramental life, and as described by St. John of Damascus in his third treatise on divine images. There are different kinds of symbols and icons, my friends, that are present throughout all of Byzantine uh, liturgical rites, including the divine liturgy. So of course the divine liturgy, regardless of the other memories uh, inserted into it of salvation history, is of course remembering the mystical supper, but other memories also enter into it. That's the way it is with every single Byzantine liturgical celebration. The point is to have a wholesome cross-referencing of the entire tradition and of all of salvation history. It's never just one thing because to cross-reference is to get this wholesome picture of all of God's good works for us. But more specifically, St. John of Damascus in his third treatise uh, on the divine images explains lists, categorizes the different kinds of symbols or icons. And he also distinguishes the various ways or levels, if you will, of veneration or respect paid to the different kinds of images in the life of the church. The symbolism of the communion spoon, which attaches to it the remembrance of a past event, the vision of Isaiah, would belong to St. John of Damascus's sixth category of images, although John of Damascus, because he lived uh, earlier than anyone ever heard of a liturgical spoon, right? He lives, uh, most of his uh, writing occurs in the first half of the eighth century, so that's before the liturgical spoon, but I just wanna say that his category, uh, as described as follows, is uh, for the liturgical spoon, the following. I'm gonna quote St. John of Damascus. Everybody listen, quote, the sixth kind of image, writes the Damascene, the sixth kind of image is for a remembrance of past events, of a miracle or a good deed, for the honor and glory and abiding memory of the most virtuous, or for the shame and terror of the wicked, for the benefit of succeeding generations who contemplate it, so that we may shun evil and do good." End of quote. So we can see that the point of remembering the past event of Isaiah's receiving the burning coal when we look upon the communion spoon as an image of the tongues held by the seraph is quote unquote for our benefit, according to St. John of Damascus. We are to imitate the good done by Isaiah of receiving God's heavenly coal, that is in our case, the body and blood of his son. And we are to proceed uh, to follow his call to us, to follow our vocation and to say with Isaiah, here I am, take me. The other lesson we can glean about the liturgical icon that is the communion spoon from the reflections of St. John of Damascus on images is how we are to respect, exactly how we are to respect the sacred or dedicated vessel that is the spoon. 
I say sacred or dedicated because you realize that sacred means dedicated. So a vessel, say, I don't know, I don't have a spoon here, uh, but if I'm using it simply for profane purposes, the difference between that vessel, say if I have some kind of a spoon lying around here, or if we have a spoon, still a spoon, but it's uh, lying in the sanctuary in church and to be used for Holy Communion, well, the difference between the sacred vessel and the vessel here is the purpose to which they are dedicated. So the dedication uh, by the church of a specific vessel, or when the, the church ordains a person, for example, that's a different kind, but still a sanctification of someone. It means being dedicated to the specific purpose. Okay, everybody gets it, right? Sacred means dedicated. I'm quoting St. John of Damascus about the kind of respect paid to the kind of vessel the communion spoon is. Again, I remind you that John of Damascus didn't know about communion spoons. He lived before that. Anyway, quote, the third kind of worship is directed to objects dedicated to God, as for instance, the Holy Gospels and other sacred books. They were written for our instruction who live in these latter days. Sacred vessels, again, chalices, thuribles, candelabra, and altars, trapeze, he writes, belong to this category. It is evident that respect is due to them all. Consider how Balthasar made the people use the sacred vessels and how God took away his kingdom from him." End of quote. So here we learn that we are not to use sacred vessels for non-sacred purposes, as did the king that's mentioned in John of Damascus's quote, the Babylonian king, Balthazar, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar or, or Nebuchadnezzar, that's in the Septuagint version of Daniel chapter five. This incident is mentioned that this grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, um, Balthazar, ordered the silver and golden cups that his grandfather had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Balthazar ordered these vessels to be brought to a great banquet that he was having for his nobles and his mistresses and his concubines uh, so that they could drink from them. And he had them used at his great you know, party. And so the prophet Daniel admonishes him for this and prophesies that Balthazar will be punished for this and he was severely punished for doing this. Let me finally get to my conclusions. By way of conclusion, I'd like to reflect on what all this can mean for our present day conundrum of what to do or what not to do with the communion spoon in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here are my suggestions, which are no more and no less than my opinion on the basis of all of the above. So number one, we should admit we have a problem and be flexible enough to resolve it. Just as the ancient method of the distribution of Holy Communion became a problem for practical reasons in earlier periods of church history for very different reasons, uh, and thus it was changed despite the fact that the ancient method was the way the Lord himself distributed it and commanded to do this, in remembrance of him, so has it become a problem in the modern day. Yes, for different reasons, but still, it's very daunting. It was very daunting to, to suggest a change to the way in which the Lord distributed communion. We shouldn't underestimate the gravity of the change to the spoon. I could imagine if we had all the sources, but you know that history doesn't record everything that was said, there was no tape recorder. Very few things are recorded as to what happened. In any event, were there people back then saying, you don't believe that the Lord knew what he was doing, that he distributed that way, that he told everyone to do this in remembrance of him? Are you of little faith? Do you think maybe people were shaming one another, uh, you know, because this wasn't the way it was always done? Well, we do have some recorded 
complaints about the innovation. I couldn't get into all of it in this paper, but I did in the audio podcast, you could listen, the criticism of the innovation. I'm not gonna get into it now, I just wanna compare it, you know, to the fact that it's not the first time that a suggested change, by the way, spoiler alert, I'm not gonna suggest any radical change, but what I wanna say is to, to be saying right now that any kind of change is because of a lack of faith, I think is perhaps uh, unnecessary. Rather than pretending that the practice of using one common communion spoon is a problem only for those of little faith, and leaving aside the mutual shaming and accusations from both sides of the issue inside the church as to whether or not the sacred species can pass on the coronavirus, I think we should recognize that many of our church hierarchs do face a problem in any event, leaving aside all of that. They have the practical problem of the civil authorities. They have corona-related restrictions of the civil authorities uh, in various countries worldwide. And the civil authorities have simply forbidden the customary use of the communion spoon in at least several countries that I know of, for example, right here in Austria and in neighboring Germany, which is why uh, here, both in Austria and in Germany, at least uh, two dioceses that I know of, uh, promptly made the decision to modify their way of distributing Holy Communion, just for the sake of building up the church, that is katikonomian, to build up God's church, uh, that communion can be distributed at all. I think this is in line with the traditional flexibility of the Orthodox Church uh, with regard, yes, also to the way uh, she has distributed her sacraments, not only communion, but she has modified uh, in painful ways sometimes uh, the way uh, her sacraments uh, are done. You know, in, in those historical circumstances when uh, not modifying uh, the way the sacraments were done would have made it impossible uh, to have sacramental life at all, or at least when they needed to be limited somehow uh, by, because of historical circumstances, the Orthodox Church has shown a remarkable flexibility here. For example, in the case of the sacrament of ordination, the church has tolerated time and again, actually, the involvement of civil authorities in the election process of hierarchs. Despite, despite everybody, Canon 30 of the Holy Apostles, which strictly forbids the involvement of civil authorities. Also in the case of the sacrament of holy matrimony, that's a whole separate can of worms. Uh, and if one studies the history of this sacrament, uh, it opens up a lot of very challenging factoids from church history and just how much the state in the Byzantine Empire, well, especially, uh, look at what was going on for most of the first millennium. Who made the decisions about the dissolution of marriages, uh, the state. I can't get into that either. However, uh, we don't see evidence of the church protesting this. And we see that there was, well, a lot could be said about this, uh, you know, a lot of critical things. Uh, nonetheless, the fact remains that there was a healthy, I think, realism to dealing with governmental realities and of other realities also of uh, just human reality that is the imperfect human reality that is history. And I think that there was a flexibility of the church living in this world also with regard to the external practices of certain sacraments. Let me get to my second point. Don't despair, I'm getting there. My second point is we should retain the communion spoon, mutatis mutandis. This might be a surprise, 
uh, to a lot of you, but I'm all for maintaining. I don't think it's going anywhere um, anyway, but I wasn't about to, uh, I wasn't about to pitch getting rid of the communion spoon. Why not? Well, for one thing, it is part of our liturgical language. It's part of the symbolic system or symbolgestalt of the Byzantine rite that we inherited. And one should not easily change the symbolic language to which people of a certain tradition are accustomed. Now, the Roman Catholics know this. The Roman Catholic Church knows this, uh, which is why it traditionally, anyway, placed strict canonical restrictions on changing ritual practices, mixing practices from different liturgical traditions with a, within one and the same celebration. That would be known as ritual eclectism. Uh, or also it strictly uh, regulates granting priests what are known as bi-ritual faculties. That is, uh, they need an indult, a special permission, papal permission to celebrate a rite other than their own. So you don't hop from one practice to another as a priest, say, you know, if uh, our church, some of our Orthodox churches now have Western rite parishes. Um, in the canonical codex of the Orthodox church, uh, there is not much legislation about the whole question of liturgical rites. There is about, there are basically the canonical issues about liturgy really concern uh, the commemoration at a liturgy. It's not the only issue, but you know, far in between there are canons regulating liturgy. However, the big canonical question usually for Orthodox churches is, is the parish or monastery commemorating the proper bishop? But as far as mixing rites, uh, I don't think that we have our radars very sensitive to, you know, the, I would say, the unhealthy aspects of mixing rights and the, what are the problems behind that? Why would one legislate about it? Well, I'm getting to that. So, like I just said, the Catholics have this, a lot of legislation concerning this. They do have a lot of different rights, various rights within their communion. Now, I think that the wisdom behind that, please don't get upset that I'm inserting uh, Roman Catholic thinking on this because it's a question for our today. You know, when people are suggesting, for example, it was suggested by a local bishop here, and it is the present day practice right now in the COVID-19 uh, era, uh, to practice the distribution of communion into the hand uh, as if, that was the tradition of the liturgy of St. James from Jerusalem. That was explicitly said by the Greek uh, bishop here, uh, the local bishop in Austria. Uh, anyway, can one simply mix various rites, like the rite of St. James, put it into the uh, liturgy of St. John Chrysostom or of St. Basil? Do we even think that that might be a mixture of different languages in one right. I don't think we think about it. I'm thinking about it now and I'm telling you what I'm thinking. So I think that the wisdom, my friends, of being careful when changing symbolic systems is that it's difficult for most of us to learn a new language. You know, to learn a new language, that's what it is when you, if you go, for example, to a different church, say that's celebrating in the Western Rite, uh, do you immediately feel the same like associations with the types of images you see, the types of liturgical action, the different types of vestment? You, if you're not accustomed to it, it feels a little weird, right? Uh, it's simply not habitual. It's not a matter of it being bad or good. That's not my point. I'm trying to discuss the topic of changing liturgical languages. So I think the wisdom of being careful uh, when doing that um, is to recognize that it is difficult for most of us to learn a new language. And it's difficult for us 
and not like a, something that's usually necessary, uh, to learn to recognize, so to say, familiar meanings in unfamiliar symbols. You see, a symbol is immediately recognizable to one who is used to it, that it means something else. As St. John Chrysostom says, you see one thing in mystagogy, but you understand it to mean another. Now, it takes a whole re-education to see a different symbol and to realize that that's what that means. Of course, it can be done, uh, but I really think it should not be done unless absolutely necessary, because imposing that on a whole uh, practicing worshiping community or on an entire rite, say the Byzantine rite, uh, that kind of a change can be traumatic. And I don't think that our habits are a small uh, reason or an invalid reason not to do something, but just hang in there because uh, I'm gonna say that it does need to be modified. I think for the reasons described in my first point about the importance, regardless of what you think about the sacred species passing on disease or not, uh, the church does live in this world and uh, is to abide, the hierarchs know that, uh, is to abide uh, by governmental uh, rules and restrictions. They have that responsibility. They have to deal with it. A lot of the people that will be accusing the hierarchs of having a lack of faith don't carry their responsibility. Somebody has to call the shots, right? But um, carrying the responsibility and having to preside over the church's closing because you didn't want to make a little bit of a modification, um, you know, that's a burden that the bishop has to carry. Anyway, hear me out. I'm almost finished. I think that in the case of the liturgical spoon, there is not this absolute necessity to get rid of it. But what I do think is that without any, uh, you know, violence done to the tradition uh, in a very small modification, uh, the suggestion that's been made by many, and I think it's completely reasonable, and I will defend that position right now uh, for both sides of this issue. I think everybody can be happy with it. The bamboo or wooden spoons, disposable spoons. They're easy to burn, it's not messy, and it's eco-friendly for anybody that cares about the, the climate stuff. Uh, and it's also not profaning a holy vessel. Uh, these spoons, you know, St. John of Damascus, as I just quoted, uh, was uh, describing the concerns that the church has for profaning holy vessels. We're not allowed to do that. But in the case, if one, if each parish would have these, they're, they're inexpensive wooden or bamboo spoons, uh, have, you know, next to where the priest is just distributing communion, uh, a bag of these spoons, and then there's a paper bag that's going to be burned where carefully the spoons after each communicant are put into the bag and taken to a place where people don't walk, you know, don't trample, they are burned. This is what we do with sacred objects that need to be burned. So it's simple and it, like I said, um, it is not profaning the vessels and it also satisfies the hygienic concerns of governmental authorities and others uh, and it preserves the symbolic language, which is a concern of mine, I'm sorry, but I'm a liturgical dork, and I'm also concerned uh, about the preservation of our liturgical language and about our learning about it and understanding it and being mystagogized, my friends. Uh, these are my thoughts. Do forgive me. Thank you for hearing me out. And I do pray and hope that this does not further divide us uh, and that if the, these are not helpful suggestions or thoughts to anybody out there uh, that you simply forgive me and move on uh, to the next speaker. Thank you for listening and a happy Pentecost to everybody. Bye. Bye.